Welcome back. Let's discuss exciting new research that informs how to improve sleep, fatigue, and mood. And as you may know, myself and our research team are purviewing this Niagara Falls of research that's being published on a daily basis, pulling out for you the studies that we feel are of the highest quality and also of the highest applicability. So today we'll cover a few studies, one on which we can learn how exercise can fully negate the negative impacts of poor sleep. Another study showing that probiotics can improve post-infectious fatigue whether it be COVID-19, Epstein-Barr virus. So another, in my mind, very relevant study. One research paper on a natural tool that is more effective for improving insomnia than insomnia medications. We'll do a quick examination of blue light blocking glasses. Are these helpful for sleep or hype? And also look at caffeine and a couple insights regarding caffeine consumption and what to do and not to do regarding impacts on sleep. Welcome to Dr. Ruscio Radio, providing practical, science-based insights into health. We break through the bias and the noise to bring you simple, trustworthy information that matters. Okay, so let's kick off with this really, in my mind, fascinating study. 2023 observational study in 92 thousand individuals. So even though it's observational and observational data isn't necessarily the highest quality, it's in 92,000 individuals, very high sample size. Now they looked at, again, can exercise buffer the negative impacts of sleep? Defining insufficient sleep as less than six hours per night. So in some cases it might be you can't sleep that long because you have insomnia or you choose not to due to work or other life events. If they obtained exercise that was adequate, adequate being defined as 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous exercise. So this is not a lot. 150 is three or four exercise sessions per week, depending on how long each session is. And it didn't seem to matter what type of exercise. But here's the key finding. In those who didn't sleep well, there was an 88% increase of this metric known as all-cause mortality. So that's death from any cause. So if we add up accidents, falls, cancers, heart disease, neurocognitive diseases of whatever sort, it summates to death from any cause, aka all-cause mortality. So the people who didn't sleep enough had an 88% increased risk of, of death from any cause, which was fully erased if people exercised for 150 minutes per week, leading these researchers to state, a higher volume of physical activity attenuated the detrimental effects of insufficient sleep on all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality risk. So, as I've been um, trying to here on the show for a while, encourage you to exercise because data like this are extremely compelling. By the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. Okay, this next study I also found to be quite relevant, quite interesting. 2023 randomized control trial. 70 people who had fatigue after an infection. That infection may have been Epstein-Barr, COVID-19, Borrelia, Lyme, or a respiratory tract infection. They were given either placebo or a probiotic vitamin blend containing a lactobacillus bifidobacterium type blend at about 10 billion per day, so a standard probiotic dose, paired with a vitamin that was a B-complex, magnesium, manganese, and a prebiotic. And what they found was those in the treatment group had improved quality of life, improved depression, and improved fatigue. And this is a, a graphic I'll narrate, but one of the things here I wanted to point out, so on the show, we're always trying to determine, well, how long do I have to do a therapy or, or a diet trial before I can judge if it's helpful or not? And interestingly, in this study, the difference between groups did not become significant until the six-month mark. There's a, a trend you see at three months, but it really wasn't significant until six. So I keep trying to share this because on the one hand, I fairly uniformly see when working with people, if something is the right fit, they're going to know inside of a month. But there are data points that have shown two or three or even four months 
until a real significant effect is realized. So this is something that you'll have to take on a case-by-case -case basis, but just wanted to share what I found interesting from this paper regarding time to response. And to quote this research paper, these findings suggest that probiotics may be a promising intervention for improving the health of patients with post-infectious fatigue. Now we mentioned a moment ago, a tool for insomnia. And this is known as CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. And a 2023 observational study found that online cognitive behavioral therapy was more effective than medications for insomnia. What I find compelling and utilitarian about this is the fact that it's online. So you didn't have to go to a therapist's office. Obviously, that makes this much more convenient. 4,000 patients, they were given sleep medication or cognitive behavioral therapy or a combination of the two. And at six months, they found that the cognitive behavioral therapy was more effective than the medication for insomnia, anxiety, depression, but the combination of the two was the best. So logically, I think you could start, consider starting with cognitive behavioral therapy. If that's sufficient, awesome. And if it's not, you could consider adding a medication of some sort on top of that. And a few resources for you. There's one fairly noteworthy book called Quiet Your Mind and Get to Sleep. We'll link to an online program and also a directory for finding a local cognitive behavioral therapist. Now on the topic of sleep, blue light comes up. And why blue light is relevant, you may already know this. Your eyes sense light, of course, and the eyes will trigger the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is part of the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is the master regulator of your endocrine system, which includes melatonin. So when we have daylight, this inhibits the production of melatonin, which is good because melatonin makes you sleepy. You don't want to be sleepy during the day. And at nighttime, if you don't have a lot of light exposure, you inhibit the suppression or you allow the production of melatonin and therefore you sleep. So it follows that techniques to reduce blue light at night may improve melatonin and therefore sleep. But as you're probably accustomed to me asking, show me the data. So a 2023 systematic review of six randomized control trials pitted placebo, so non-blue light blocking glasses, clear lenses essentially, versus blue light blocking glasses that were worn an hour and a half to three hours before bed. And they did find that the blue light blocking glasses group had improvements in sleep quality in four of the six studies that were analyzed. Now, another important study here looked at healthy individuals who didn't have insomnia at baseline. 2019 randomized control trial, albeit small, 15 patients, but they did find that in otherwise healthy individuals, the use of blue light glasses prior to bed improved the ability to fall asleep quickly, sleep quality, and also morning alertness. So I think it's safe to say that one strategy you could use to improve your sleep would be blue light glasses. Also, you can use blue light filtering apps on your computer, on your phone, and just logically dim the lights in your home and opt for lights that are more yellow than they are white because the white will have the blue and the yellow will have less blue. And one point I wanted to make, admittedly, with no data, I found it silly when I see people wear blue light blocking glasses 24 seven, as if blue light's going to kill you. <laughs> and there's a data point here that helps reinforce my intuitive sense. Finding that blue light exposure during the day is helpful for alertness, which makes sense. 2019 observational study, they took a small group of university students and exposed them either to warm light, so this is something that's gonna be more yellow, or blue light. And they found the blue light exposure group had increased alertness, better mood, and a reduction in their melatonin levels, which during the day, obviously, you want. So just to note, if you're one of the people who's been led to believe that blue light is always problematic, that's not true. Blue light during the day is good. Blue light prior to bed, we want to try to filter out or reduce. And speaking of sleep, caffeine, of course, here is relevant and Caffeine will block another compound called adenosine. And you need adenosine to 
build up in order to sleep. So if you block too much adenosine, then it's built up when you try to go to bed and therefore you can't sleep. So this is why caffeine timing can be relevant, of course, to sleep. So this brings us to a 2023 meta-analysis and they found that caffeine consumption in general was associated with 45 minutes less of sleep, a longer time to fall asleep, and also less deep sleep. But here's the kicker. These effects did not occur. There was no negative impact on sleep if the caffeine was consumed roughly 12 hours before bed. And this is an important caveat uh, because certainly with some of the information that has surfaced on the ability of caffeine to derange sleep, we often have this sort of baby with the bathwater or this overcorrection wherein people drink no caffeine. If you drink the caffeine early in the day, again, roughly 12 hours, there doesn't seem to be any consistent negative impact on one's sleep. And just some quick numbers here. If you have 200 milligrams of caffeine at nine in the morning, by nine at night, you'll have 25 milligrams circulating. If you have 200 milligrams at one, you'll have three times that. You'll have 75 milligrams circulating at 9 p.m. So it's important to bear in mind that timing with caffeine is very important. And I would recommend getting the caffeine in early in the morning. People are different in terms of their endogenous caffeine clearance, if you will. So you want to make note of where that line is for you. But certainly said simply, the earlier, the better with caffeine consumption. So caffeine can give you energy. Mitochondrial supports, vitamins, can also do the same thing. A 2023 observational study looking at 174 individuals with chronic fatigue after a COVID-19 infection were given either control, so this would be pain medications, yoga, and counseling was the control in this study, or they were given mitochondrial support, CoQ10 and alpha-lipoic acid, plus the control. And what they found was after two months, those receiving the mitochondrial supplement on top of the control interventions had a 50% reduction in fatigue, poor sleep, and in pain. I do feel mitochondrial supplements are an area where we need better research. So looking at something like this is, is quite helpful. Uh, and especially when given against a control group to compare the effects and, and to mitigate the impact of placebo. So if you've had an infection or otherwise, if you're struggling with fatigue, something to consider might be CoQ10 100 milligrams per day and alpha lipoic acid 100 milligrams per day also. Coming back to exercise, if you're someone who hasn't quite gained traction with exercising, this meta-analysis I think could be for you. They summarized 33 randomized control trials in just over 2,000 individuals with either fatigue or with other chronic conditions, autoimmune diseases, cancers, fibromyalgia, IBS. And this is what's interesting. They found the most effective intervention for fatigue was what's known as exer gaming. So game exercise. That was the most effective. Now, second to that was either cycling or a combination of aerobic and strength training. Either one led to the similar results of, of what's known as a moderate effect size. So cycling or aerobic plus strength, either one of these led to a moderate impact. But the extra gaming led to a large effect size, leading the researchers to conclude physical activity has a modest effect on fatigue amongst adults with chronic conditions. And where I think extra gaming is interesting, if you're someone who hasn't really taken up habitually the habit of exercise, it might be that you just don't like going to the gym and you get bored. And it may also be that if you do go to the gym or a walk or a run, you don't push yourself. And when we're playing games, it's easier to get wrapped up in the game and work harder without realizing it. And as someone who's played sports throughout my life, I can say, this is clearly when I work the hardest. So something to consider if you're not getting traction with exercise might be extra gaming. And then the final two studies bring us back to mood and stress, this time looking at the impact of meditation. 10,000 subjects with anxiety, sadness, and or stress were given a meditation app called Insight Timer. And they found that meditation was effective for improving either the anxiety, the sadness, and or the stress when people practiced it four to seven days per week. 
they didn't find that the length of the session had an impact. And this, I think, is very crucial. You'll sometimes hear someone say, oh, I meditate for 45 minutes per day. And my internal response to that is, boy, where do you find the time? And if you're someone who is being told, well, it's got to be 20 minutes. If it's not 20 minutes, it's not sufficient. And then you therefore don't meditate. You might miss the key finding from this fairly large study, which was consistency was more important than duration. And the four to seven days per week was, was the real um, mark to try to hit here. But again, not giving yourself a quota regarding time. And this leads to the researchers' comments. Our findings suggest that it was the consistency of practice, not the length of individual sessions, that was the most important predictor of change. One thing to keep in mind, and as I say with a diet, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So here that same thing would apply. And I just wanted to tie one concept to why it may have been those undergoing the insight timer meditation practice had improved sadness and, and stress and, and, and what have you. This comes from a 2014 clinical trial. And what they did was put people in a functional MRI before and then after meditation. And while they were in the MRI, they showed them startling images. In fact, I, I wanted to share one with you, but I wasn't sure if we'd get some sort of YouTube censorship. It's a person pointing a gun in your face, and it's, it's certainly unpleasant to look at. And here's what they found. The people who were practicing mindfulness meditation, when scanning their brains, there was a significantly lowered activation of their amygdala, a center in the brain that tends to overfunction when people are stressed and anxious. And what was elegant about this study in particular is they compared it to a control group. So half of the people practice mindfulness meditation, the other half didn't do anything. They get in the functional MRI, scan their brains while showing them these scary images, and they see a, a really noteworthy reduction in the fear governing center of the brain, the amygdala. So I just wanted to tie that in for you regarding one of the things happening in the brain that is beneficial when you meditate. So to round this all out in summary, there is a lot of power in your hands. Exercise as we covered can fully negate the negative impact of insufficient sleep and also improve your energy. Probiotics along with a multivitamin essentially can improve fatigue. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be more effective than monotherapeutic of medication. Mitochondrial support can improve your energy as CoQ10 and alpha-lipoic acid. And meditation can improve your mood and your brain health. So, so many great tools that you can use to improve your health. And I hope that these do improve your health and that you'll let me know about it in the comments. All right, guys, this is Dr. Ruscio. I will talk to you next time. <laughs>